Two to post four, area pure secure. Hey, this is crazy. Being here is crazy. I just wonder what it would be like to walk out that gate. People telling you when to get up, when to go to sleep, where you can go, sit down. We've had a 200% increase in the number of women going to prison in this country in the last 15 years. It's not allowed. It's a punishable behavior, any type of deviant sexual behavior. I don't like this place, but I deserve to be here. I got to win this fight this time because I really feel this is my last chance. Jail cells, searchlights, guard dogs, barbed wire. These are images that come to mind when we think about prison. Every day in Canada and the United States, thousands of women wake up in that controlled, isolated world. Every waking moment, they follow orders and obey rules. They are cut off from their families and the lives they took for granted. But ironically, some prisons can offer inmates a set of choices they never had before. A set of choices intended to educate and empower and ultimately to liberate. Three prisons for women, all grappling with the same goal to send the inmates home permanently. The prison for women in Kingston, Ontario. This was once Canada's only prison for women. Its long, miserable history has sealed its fate. Currently in limbo, it now awaits its own execution. The Kentucky Correctional Institute for Women, located in the American Bible Belt. It once housed just 50 women. The razor fences and guard towers will soon contain 1,000 women inmates. In British Columbia, the Burnaby Correctional Center for Women. Built in the 1990s, it looks more like a community center. Its bright, open, modern look embodies a more humane approach. For some inmates, these prisons are safe havens from the violence and sexual abuse experienced beyond the gates. The atmosphere is very different from a male prison. You take this facility, take the females out, put the male in inmates here, you wouldn't have this facility. They probably have it tore completely apart. The escape ratio would be tremendous. Uh, it, it just wouldn't work with the male institutions. I had an opportunity to come to KCIW seven years ago. Uh, when I first come into the facility, of course, I saw the surroundings and I'm, you know, thinking this is a resort, you know. I'm thinking that these inmates uh, are allowed to do anything that they want. This is the only prison for women in Kentucky housing 680 inmates. It represents the widest range of situations, from maximum to minimum security, from grandmothers to granddaughters. These women make up only 6% of the total number of prisoners in Kentucky. We as a staff perceive people as being redeemable. I'm Betty Kosalki. I'm warden of the Kentucky Correctional Institution for Women, located in Pee Wee Valley, Kentucky. Uh, Kosalki is a veteran of the American prison system. She began at KCIW in the mid 1960s when it housed just 50 women. What if you all, let me ask you, what, how has this made this real for you all? She has worked in other facilities, but has always returned to Kentucky. Out of all the, the 12 institutions, I'm the only female. I'm the only female warden, and I just feel that my heart is here in terms of, of taking care of the, the needs of women and understanding the women's needs. Can. And that's going to be difficult. Of Kentucky's 12 institutions, Kosulke runs one of the toughest in the state. There are few options for inmates. 
KCIW controls the way people live every waking moment. Prison is very inconvenient for people, and new inmates have a hard time accepting that inconvenience. Uh, they lose their property, they're separated from their families. Uh, we tell them when to go to bed and when to get up and when, when and what they're going to eat. Where you can go, sit down, when to eat, it ain't no life to live. The hardest part about being here is um, the write-ups. Correct behavior is any time a staff member tells them to do something, they are to do it without any argument at all. Petty write-ups. They will write you up for anything. If they have questions, they should be allowed to come to a staff member and ask, and they do. In prison, the loss of freedom affects even the smallest activities, like taking a daily dose of medicine. What I'm going to do is check and make sure that they're not hiding in their mouth and taking it and selling it upstairs. Next. Feel any better? The loss of physical freedom is reinforced by 24-hour surveillance that follows every inmate through every room in the prison. We have 16 monitors. Uh, we have a monitor for the main building. Uh, we have monitors for the steps uh, for inmates that are going up and down the steps. We have monitors on the dormitories. Uh, we have uh, a view of the outside perimeter uh, of our complex. Um, we have our laundry room, and we have our vocational school, and of course this little breezeway through here that we have our midline. These cameras record uh, 24 hours a day, and it is uh, taped in the tape recorder, and we can review those tapes. Our next count is at, uh, at 350. We'll go through and count all the dorms, and we'll call our count in and wait for clearance before our next shift. We always have to make sure our numbers add up. They do 12 counts a day. For all the rules to work, Betty Kosalki relies on her staff to maintain a difficult balance between constraint and compassion. I look for individuals that are caring, but that can also give orders, and give orders in such a way that it doesn't sound like a, a request, nor does it sound like a demand. People who are smiling cops. Yes. You do the Real quick. Tell me what you need. You know what that's for? What? What Miss Mason talked to you about. Okay. And I'll check it and I'll come back and talk to you. And I found when inmates had um, conflicts, we didn't shove them off no matter how minor they were. We still have the philosophy that correctional officers need to patrol and walk through dormitories and have face-to-face -face contact and communication with prisoners. The world of prison is routine for the staff who work there every day. First time prisoners enter an unknown, almost mythical world. When we have uh, first time offenders come into the institution, most of them are frightened. A lot of what they see on TV and what other people tell them is not true once they get here. A lot of them cry and they shake. When I first came to KCIW, I had a preconceived notion, just the same as the general public has, of what inmates are supposed to look like or how they're supposed to act. And when I got here, I was amazed because they looked like my next door neighbor or my cousin or my family member. My name is Marie, and I'm serving a 20-year sentence. If Marie Laswell is, is a, a, a tragedy. Never should have happened. At KCIW, there are 680 prisoners, 680 stories of flawed choices and desperate measures that brought them to the last place on earth they want to be. I've grown up here, you know, since I was 16 years old. I've been incarcerated, so I've grown up here. And uh, I've never really experienced the adult world. Marie's story should have been a common teenage romance. Adopted into a loving but conservative family, she began to date someone her parents disliked. I left home because my parents forbid me to do something and I was hell-bent on doing it. Excuse my language, but I was hell-bent on doing it. And uh, they told me I could not see this boy. Well, I told them, well, you don't love me if you won't allow me to see him. So I left with him. Shoot a shot for the yellow number one ball. 
got in with the wrong crowd. Wrong time, wrong place, you know, and unfortunately ended up in prison. Living on the run, Marie and her childhood sweetheart found that, for a while at least, crime could pay their meager bills. Then one night in November 1990, Marie remained outside while her boyfriend and accomplice walked in to rob a jewelry store. Police this morning arrested John Martinez and George Pierponts, both 18. The two men are accused in connection with the slayings of Rayburn and Dolores Lavelle of Waverly, Kentucky. Police also took a female who was staying with Martinez and Pierpont into custody. Well, when my co-defendant went in with a gun, he got into a fight and the man was shot. And my other co-defendant, who was my boyfriend, went in behind him and shot the woman that was there because she was a witness. Following their recent murder and robbery indictments by a Union County grand jury, John Martinez and Robert Pierpont were back in court today. This time, Pierpont's 17-year-old girlfriend, Marie Laswell, was with them. The girl, who was 16 at the time Rayburn and Dolores Lavelle were killed, has been waived to adult court, charged with assisting in the crime. Authorities allege that the girl drove the getaway car. I don't like this place, but I deserve to be here. A short-term visit to Canada's most notorious prison for women. When we return to Forbidden Places. <music> Kingston, Ontario's prison for women. Built in the 1930s, it was once Canada's only prison for women. Whether they lived in British Columbia or the Maritimes, women would be incarcerated in the center of the country thousands of kilometers away from family and friends. From the very start, conditions were grim. They never got better. A 1977 report put it bluntly, P4W is not fit for bears, much less women. In 1994, a wave of inmate suicides and a riot sealed the fate of this dismal relic. The physical structure is very limiting for us uh, as far as what we can do. I think that if we had a different physical structure, we could meet the needs of the women uh, in a more comprehensive manner and in a more humane manner. I'm Therese Leblanc. I'm the warden at the Prison for Women uh, in Kingston, Ontario. Leblanc is waiting for the federal government to decide what to do with the dozen or so inmates remaining in Kingston. Some of the history that the women come with are, are horrendous. I mean, uh, some of them have been sexually and physically abused since they've been uh, young children. In many ways, they're uh, fantastically strong for having simply survived the lives that they've lived. I'm Tracy Thornbury. I'm 27 years old. I've been in a prison since I was nine. Tracy never knew her father. Her mother was a heroin addict and a prostitute. Her childhood was an urban nightmare. At the age of six, my mother would uh, intravenously hit me up with heroin, tie me to a bed, and uh, let her customers come in and abuse me. I can remember sitting on the end of the bed laughing at me, and you know, that's supposed to be the person that looks out for me, helps me, keeps me safe. 82% of all of the women serving two years or more in this country had experienced physical and or sexual abuse. Tracy never had a chance to have a childhood. At an age when most children are worrying about getting dates, going to school, Tracy decided to run away and hit the streets. The only thing I knew was prostitution and that, okay, they give you money for doing that. So this time I'm going to run away, but I'm not going to go to Children's Aid or my grandma. I'm just going to go. Nobody will know where I am. Living on the street, Tracy began to follow her own mother's footsteps. Then I was hungry in an alleyway. I didn't know what to do. What do I do? I go turn a trick. And, you know, it was easy. It was fast, and it was an abuse I was used to. Her life on the street reached a dead end one night when a long-time customer demanded more than she was willing to do. He knew I was pregnant, and he knew I would not have intercourse. I would only have fellatio, and uh, 
he decided to do something more. And uh, I was pinned down. I just remember putting my head saying in my mind, just let him do it. I'm used to it. I can get over it. And he was hurting me. And he started biting me and, and everything. So when I had my head this way, I saw there was a pair of scissors. So I turned around and I stabbed him in the bum. When he got up, I said, now just let me go. I promise I won't tell anybody. Just let me leave. It's over, you can keep your money. You can, because he used to always give me hash as well. I said, you can keep your money, you can keep everything. And I promise you, I won't tell anybody. And I was on my knees. And he just, you know, it continued. And uh, I blacked out. All I remember after that was when I woke up, I was caked. I, you couldn't see my skin. I was caked in blood and I panicked. And when I shook, the scissors dropped from my hand, and I'm looking around. I didn't see anybody but me, so I'm looking, and you know, I was my hands were all cut up, blood all over the walls. And when I looked down, there was his body. I ran to the bathroom. I grabbed all the towels, I put them under cold water, and I packed all the holes. There were so many holes, there was not enough. There was nothing I could do, so I laid on top of his body to stop the bleeding. What the majority of women who commit violent offenses, it's reactive violence. That doesn't mean it's okay, and it doesn't mean we condone it, we want to see it happen. But the reality is someone reacting to having been raped, someone reacting to someone attacking and battering them is a vastly different situation than the sorts of predatory violence that people generally think of when they think of men or women being violent. For her crime, Tracy was convicted of manslaughter and sent to the Kingston Prison for Women. Compared to the world she grew up in, prison has turned out to be an unlikely refuge. I got a bed, I got three squares, you get some friends, and you got people that'll talk to you and listen to your pain and try to help you solve it. So it became a safe home front for me, coming to prison. So then it became I'd start getting in trouble on purpose because I had things. If Kingston's P4W represents the past, then Burnaby Correctional Center for Women signals a more humane present. Open in the 1990s, it is one of five regional correctional centers. The staff here are very committed to doing the best they can to help the women leave and not come back. I'm Nancy Ranchall, District Director at Burnaby Correctional Center for Women. Uh, I like to think that uh, we've progressed to the point where uh, we don't need to have prisons be cold, dark, and damp places uh, to keep people in. We have the creme de la creme of prisons. You got that. Burnaby right. Country Club for Women. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> club <laughs> men. <laughs> Most of the time everybody gets along, but I mean, every once in a while we have our odd episodes, but. We handle them. Yeah, you don't find too many try. fights. In here. Well, yeah, we try. <laughs> so, like, there's quite a few women in here that are here for life. You know, this is their this is their home. And in this home, these inmates see a continuous flow of new faces, others they've seen before. Especially when you're going to be, you're looking at like doing like three, <laughs> four years in here. It's like really hard to you start just getting to know somebody, and then they're gone. It's like it's a real hard thing. So, needless but to say. wait a month or two and they're back. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Job yeah, security, yeah. buddy, because they don't have programs to straighten people exactly. out. Exactly. At Burnaby, one program in particular has been useful for teaching inmates about friendship and trust. It's directed by Jane Nelson. Hi, Sally. Hi, sweetie. The customers really benefit from the service that the women provide, um, and I think the women benefit uh, an amazing amount from the uh, interaction with the dogs, the interaction with the clients, running the business, um, you know, going out with certificates that, that they could potentially, um, you know, pursue careers with. One of the, the long-term women here has recently been released and she's now working full-time in the industry and um, doing really well and really happy, really confident, really proud of herself. Um, I guess that's really what it's about. 
For those still grappling with the issues that helped put them in prison, working in the kennel is a way to heal badly bruised self-esteem. My name's Brenda, I'm a BCCW, and I'm a recovering heroin addict. I used to have a home and a car and a family, and my husband left me. My son was uh, shot. It just seemed like too much was happening at once, and I just, I gave up. I quit my job, and, uh, and there was heroin readily available, and I found that it actually it numbed the feelings. You're a good girl. I had a foster son. He, uh, he came to us when he was quite young. And two years ago, he took his own life because of heroin addiction. And my two natural sons are also heroin addicts. You're a good girl. Yes. Myself, I've OD'd a couple of times. I was lucky that somebody's around that cared about me, who happened to be my son. You're a good girl. It's not a nice life at all. So all I can do is just do the best I can do. Well, I think what we try and do is create an opportunity, create an environment where a woman can uh, uh, make changes, where it's safe to make changes. And I look, I look forward to, to getting up each day, like before I didn't, because I knew when I got up, I'd have to go out and steal to get the heroin. And it was just a vicious circle. As we all know, there's lots of drugs in prison, and I'm, I'm proud of myself. I've had it offered to me many times, and I've said no. I think I've just, I've made a promise to myself that I'm going to make it through it this time, and if I can say no here, I'm hoping I can do it on the outside too. I've thought for a few years now that I'm just a junkie, that I know I'm not just a junkie anymore. Women inmates and their struggle with drugs when we return to Forbidden Places. While every prisoner's story is unique, there are common threads in their experiences. I was sexually abused. As a child, I was abused. I couldn't go to no one and talk to no one. I felt I couldn't go to anyone, and I went to drugs. As I got older, one drug led to another. I think that was my mistake, was getting involved in drugs. I stopped believing in myself then. I take drugs and it makes me not care. I don't, I don't care. I started believing in the drugs. I feel that the problems I have, um, it led to drugs. But I, mean, I could have chose to go a different route if I wanted to, but drugs was just easier for me, you know? Arrested for burglary, this is Mary's second round at KCIW. I was on drugs when I committed burglary. Um, and that's why I committed the burglary, to, you know, just take items that would give me more drugs. Being out there in society is hard to me, you know. People not knowing how to take me, accept me for me, you know. She's starting to get the picture and starting to get things turned around a little bit for her. I think she's starting to get a focus. Um, and, it, and it may take more than once for her. That's, that's sad to say, but it may take more than once. All drugs do is cost you your life or cause you to be in places like this and be miserable and live under other people's rules, you know? I mean, this is crazy. Being here is, is crazy. For Tina Powell, the consequences were devastating. High on drugs, she and another woman brutally murdered five people in one night, making it Lexington, Kentucky's worst mass murder. All the victims had been stabbed, shot, and run over with a car. Three were burned. Tina is serving 25 years without parole and has already spent 14 years behind bars. Even though I will have put in 25 years by the time I go up for parole, the chances of me ever getting out of prison for my crime are, are very slim tonight. 
but I'm okay with that now. Those are all the people that I treasure in my life, that I love and I miss. They mean the most to me. This is my mother, one of the cakes that she bakes. She bakes beautiful cakes, doesn't she? This is me and my granddaughter. That's my grandbaby. I just got it cut about three years ago. I'm letting it grow back out again. With Tina Powell, it's up and down. Uh, she gets influenced by people here in the prison. She gets involved with people in the prison uh, that get her off track. I hear people say all the time, well, I don't regret nothing I've ever done. I've had a blast. I regret so much that I've done because there's so many people's lives that I've destroyed, including myself. I exercise about two hours every day. That's how I deal with my anger, I exercise. I go out and I, I exercise until I work off all of my stress. And that tends to work pretty well. <sighs> thirsty, thirsty. I think once you accept how long you have to be here, then everything else kind of works itself out. And when some prisoners can no longer live by the rules or present a danger to other inmates or guards, they are sent to a prison within the prison, segregation or cell block. It's a total of 44 cells, uh, wet cells, all run out of this room here, the control center. Everybody that's over here is, is uh, most of them are doing disciplinary segregation time. As far as uh, recreation goes, they come out one hour a day, five days a week, outside if it's at all possible. And uh, the other two days a week, they stay in their cell. I was in segregation for a year and three months and nine days. I was in there for a lot of different reasons, for making threatening statements against other people, hurting myself or hurting other people. Tammy, one of her biggest problems is she liked to cut on herself. And I say this, that she liked to, this is what she did most of the time as far as getting time uh, to be locked up for. That what she had told me at one point in time was she didn't feel anything and that was the only way that she felt something was when she cut herself. I can feel myself getting angry. Sometimes I can control it, sometimes I can't. She buried herself in segregation time. She ended up with like two and a half years of segregation time within like two month period of time. She uh, also did not like officers for the most part. She didn't trust anybody. What we did is we worked with her over here and eventually we managed to gain a little trust. We got her to quit cutting herself so often. The segregation, it's just, it's just the last place you go. I think emotionally, the way segregation affects them is uh, it depresses them. They lose their social contacts. It's awful. I, in my words, it's awful. I, w I don't want to go back. Segregation and security exist as a basic function of all prisons, regardless of the inmate's gender. A key difference at KCIW and other women's prisons is that most inmates are also mothers. Then I stayed in the hospital for two days. They let the baby stay in the room with me. Then the Galilean home came and picked him up Friday, and I ain't seen him since Friday. Yeah. <laughs> I was incarcerated for drugs. They won't cut it down. They'll just give me parole and let me lay on parole. But I still have a four-year sentence if I did something to come back. We have some women here that um, their parent, their mother was here. And they can remember being in this institution for what we call Kids Day. And that's kind of a bonding time with their mothers. And they thought it was so fun and they thought it was, you know, just really an adventure. And then their lives go astray and they end up getting time and coming here and they realize it wasn't as fun as we thought it would be. I'm going to try it the right way. I really am. Because I don't want to be taken from them no more. What is going on? 
At the Prison for Women, currently, I would say that uh, at least half of our population are mothers. Uh, on a national basis, you're probably looking at more, that you probably look at about 80% of the population that are mothers. And the reality is uh, many women have said that the biggest problem is not the, the doing the time, it's the separation from their children. In Kingston, Tracy's absence has damaged the relationship with her two children, both of whom are in foster care. Still, she maintains contact with her son. I, I talk to him every week. I, he doesn't call me mom. I hear him saying, calling the other lady mom, you know, and it's, uh, I can't blame him. It's not his fault. It's my fault. You know, it's my fault I'm in prison. It's my fault he doesn't know me. It's my fault I'm a drug addict, but I want help. Opposing attitudes towards lesbian relationships in prison when we return to Forbidden Places. What we've created in prisons, we've created an abnormal environment, a uh, single sex environment. If there is one sharp divergence between the Canadian and American correctional systems, it is the issue of relationships between women in prison. Kentucky has adopted a policy of zero tolerance. Sexual activity is forbidden here. There is no touching at all of another person or staff member. And they develop counterfeit relationships. And we spend a lot of our energy trying to separate people, um, trying to prevent sexual activity going on in the dormitories because we don't think that other inmates should have to be exposed to that. In Kingston and Burnaby, the wardens are more tolerant of same-sex relationships. They happen. Um, I mean, we don't uh, encourage women to become involved in relationships either with each other or people outside of the, the institution. Uh, we encourage women to focus on themselves and working on their issues and their problems as opposed to uh, being distracted. We don't lay uh, charges, institutional charges, for that behavior. In the past it was done, uh, however, uh, I think we've We've grown as has society and we simply say uh, this is their choice. And we ask that if they, they want or need to be intimate that they do it in privacy and that they respect that not everybody is comfortable uh, with displays of sexual behavior whether it's between uh, uh, same-sex people or uh, heterosexuals. For the most part the sexual relationships are consensual. Um, you have a very different, uh, sometimes it's something very different within the male institutions. This is my third time in, so I've been, what, three days now? Yeah. I liked her when I first came in here the first bit. We can touch everywhere. We can touch in the rotunda, down yeah, the like, I mean, hallway. No, the, the guards aren't too bad about it. I mean, as long as you're not openly having sex in front of their faces, they're pretty yeah. okay about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Laura, you're doing a great job. However, if this Canadian behavior happened in Kentucky, the inmates involved would find themselves in segregation. My name is Tammy Thompson. I was given 45 days in the, from the Adjustments Committee on an improper sexual behavior write-up. And I got caught in a bathroom with another woman. This is not the first time this is my third inappropriate write-up. Women don't like losing that social contact. I think that's really the biggest punishment that you have as far as the women go. No, I don't think that's going to stop my inappropriate behavior. Any type of deviant sexual behavior, whether it's with uh, uh, another inmate or if it's inappropriate in the visiting area with uh, uh, with a visitor or a relationship with the staff that's, that's uh, sexual or platonic. All of that is prohibited within a, a correctional facility and is, and is punishable. The cliché of the Internet ignoring all borders is true, even in prison. 
It raises another difference between the Canadian and American systems. So-called tricks, pen pals who end up financially supporting women prisoners. Rare in Canada, tricks are routine in the United States. As long as you don't deceive them out of their money. Right, or lie to them. That's, lie to them, yeah. As long as you honest with them, nothing will happen. But if you ain't honest with them, then... Then you get a mail you, fraud. You get in trouble, mail fraud. Some of them do it uh, because they have to. They don't have anything here, so that's that's the only way they can... Means they try support. to Yeah, that's the only means, means of support. support. You know, it used to be $25, $50, and now we're talking 30, 40, 50,000 a year. 80% of the women here probably having some kind of encounter with a trick. It helps uh, time go by, and when you get lonely, it's, it's glad to know that someone's there who cares. You know, Even though you've never met in person, just knowing that someone cares helps. A few of these women have even married these men. You know, there's been a few marriages and you know, are they going to go to them when they get out? I doubt it, you know. I mean, of course, they're going to be mad at me for saying this, you know, but, but it's the truth. We've done a lot of things to try to control mail fraud. We've reduced the number of money orders they can get in a month, um, how much money they can have on their account. But every time that we produce a new rule, they find a new avenue to get around it, and they use their parents, their grandparents. It's difficult to control because the men they write to are so vulnerable to finding a friendship. I'm going to tell you something. In here, you have to survive. You know, you have to survive the best way that you can. Preparing to enter the outside world when we return to Forbidden Places. We sell the idea that if you're going to be in prison, at least do something worthwhile with your time. Reflecting changes in our society, all three prisons for women have adopted the philosophy of empowerment, the idea that any real change cannot be enforced by the institution, but must come from the individual women prisoners. That's our goal, is that they leave here and be successful and that um, hopefully we never see them again. Rehabilitation is hands-on, distinctly personal, and in some cases, very basic. Inmates learn the simple act of working for a living and all the different skills that entails. When you talk about rehabilitation, for most of these people, we're really talking about habilitation. I mean, they didn't get these things in the beginning, you know, and so we're providing the basic structure. We're not restoring anything because for a lot of these people, they never received it in the beginning. We teach people how to work. Uh, you'd be surprised at people who've never operated a washing machine or a buffer or swept a floor or run a lawnmower. I mean, we, we have to do some very basic things in teaching people not only work skills, but how to behave. I've been here for three years, and to go out in the community feels really good. This cleanup crew will get a brief limited taste of freedom with a visit to the local baseball stadium. A lot of it has to do because most of these are minimum and community inmates and they have short terms and it helps them get out of the institution for one, they're not behind the fence anymore and they're allowed to get out in the public and it just, for what always here we get to be free and I haven't had any problems with this crew in a long time. So as long as you give them respect they'll give it back to you. Along with basic cleanup crews, Kentucky has developed an industry unit that employs a small percentage of the population. 80% of the women who come through this institution are hungry for that philosophy of doing something for themselves. How are you all doing today? Fine, how are you? Show me what you're printing today. They come in with such low self-esteem that we instill a lot of confidence and self-esteem that they can make it. Did you know how to do this before you came to prison? No, I learned it in here. And how much do we pay you a day to do this? 
Uh, 85 cents an hour. We've got six, uh, six secure. Do you want names? Tammy Huber. Burnaby has produced its own work program for inmates. Here they can learn the professional and personal skills needed in the outside world. I, I didn't want to be around flowers. I didn't want anything to do with being happy. I just, being around flowers, the smell of the greens, I didn't want the smell. I didn't want anything to do with flowers. My name is Tammy Huber. I am here in Burnaby Correctional Centre for Women for Armed Robbery. I love the smell. I love the people. I care for the people here. Especially the people who run this um, floral shop have given me a chance. And a lot of people don't give me chances. Tammy is back at Burnaby for using drugs and violating parole. I was hurt very bad by some men. And I went and used. I had been clean almost 21 months. And I used all day and I reoffended. It won't be any, anything under four years. But I have a family in here too. I wanted to come back. I felt I could be safe here. And I could go, I could get help here. At work every day, yeah, it is 8.30 till 3.30 in here. But because my own issues, I haven't been able to be here lately. If I feel I've hurt someone, I'll hurt myself. And there's been violent points where I've smashed all the glass in my room. And I've tied my arms off with socks and I've cut every vein I could find. For the first time, when I cut my throat this time, I felt it. And that scared the heck out of me when I felt my pain. We don't never know who we're doing it for. We never know who we're doing it for. We, we just put our heart into it. Moving a step closer to the world outside the gates, when we return to Forbidden Places. Living every day in a separate, confined culture, these women are doing what they can to return to a world they took for granted. A world that seems as remote and unreal to these inmates as prison does for those living on the outside. If you keep your mind outside of the gates, you will drive yourself crazy. You have to keep your mind inside of the gates to stay focused on each step that you can take to better yourself while you're inside. If I hadn't come here, I would either be dead or I would probably have AIDS, one or the other. You know, so this prison saved me. And I want to work with Aboriginal children who have been sexually abused or self-harmed. That's my dream. It's not getting any better <laughs> for me. But I refuse. The difference between me now and three years ago is I refuse to give up on myself. I see it all the time. Little girls, they come in. So she was making a statement, I can't wait to leave here. I'm not even going to think about this place. I'm going to just put it out on my I said, you need to remember how it smelled, how you felt, what the things you heard, how you felt violated when they strip searched you. You need to remember every single detail to make sure you do not come back again. So I, I pray daily, nightly, that one day they'll realize what having a life is all about and that they will have one because it's good to go home <laughs> and stay home. Every prison is a reflection of cultural attitudes. Each one reflects a society's attempts to change people who've made destructive choices, destructive for themselves and for others. Some of these women are prisoners of circumstance. Others knew exactly what they were doing but all have become prisoners of the choices they've made. Most are now trying to make different choices. Whether they succeed depends as much upon their own struggle as it does upon the choices we as a society provide for them.